So welcome everyone. I am Sean Roberts, Chief Technologist for Lincoln Network. And I'm talking to esteemed author and podcaster, uh, Corey Doctorow. He's also a special advisor to Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation. Um, welcome, Corey. Thank you very much, Sean. It's nice to talk to you. Hi, everyone. Hello. So, um, so uh, uh, full disclosure, I've spoken to Corey a couple times already. So it's not like we don't know each other. But um, one of the things that I wanted to rehash for the audience, and not maybe not everyone, with some of these concepts there's there's certainly been uh over uh, yesterday and today some discussion about big tech and anti-competitive behavior and how to curtail it what the problem is what the solutions are but i'd like to um uh, talk a little bit about um, what you've been writing on for a few years now corey about interoperability competitive compatibility and um, the mechanisms behind some of the behaviors that people are talking about and it, um, there's also something you've recently kind of coined, um, the interoperator's mm -hmm. defense. I said that kind of weird. Interoperator's defense. Um, if you could sure. kind of break down these concepts yeah. for the audience. <clears throat> well, uh, I mean, interoperability is um, it's a very technical sounding term, but it, it's something that's actually rather familiar to all of us. It's the idea that your car manufacturer doesn't get to tell you whose gas goes in the tank or that the people who sell you your shoes don't get to tell you which socks you have to wear with them. Uh, that you can buy your salt and pepper from different companies, and that the company that makes your phone shouldn't be able to tell you which apps you're allowed to run. And interoperability is is a thing that is uh, both profound and ubiquitous. Uh, interoperability is is a way to lower switching costs. So when you have lower switching costs, people take more chances. And my, my grandmother was a Soviet refugee, and when she left the Soviet Union in the 40s, she lost touch with her family for 15 years. It was a big deal. I moved here to Los Angeles from, from London five years ago. I speak to my family on Zoom every night. Uh, you know, I, I took my, my, I took some of my appliances over and got, uh, interoperable plugs and transformers that let me run them. So you can see that when people have the power to rather than take or leave an offer, but cherry pick the parts of the offer that they like and throw away the parts that they don't, that they have more agency, more self-determination and that they're able to send market signals to vendors mm. about which parts of their offers they consider valid and which ones they don't, which ones are attracted to them and which ones aren't. And um, the history of tech is the history of interoperability. It's a very powerful force in the history of tech. Latent in the design of computers and of the internet is tremendous potential for interoperability. Uh, you know, the, the universality of the computer, the fact that a, a computer can run any program uh, means that um, if you sell me a device that has a computer in it and I don't like how it works, I can change the program or install a new program, do something that allows me to get more value out of it. Um, and that is acts as a really powerful check against network effects. You know, normally we think of network effects as being like walled gardens, that once you have uh, penned in all of the users on Facebook or on MySpace, or once everyone is using Office, then it's like fax machines. Everyone needs one. Everyone's got to use Office. But what we see with interoperability is that it's like judo for network effects. So if you think about the history of any of the big tech companies, you find moments in which they were able to use interoperability adversarially to use what, what we call competitive compatibility. We used to call it adversarial interoperability, but none of our friends in Germany could pronounce it. It was like getting Germans to pronounce the word squirrel. It's impossible. <laughs> so now we call it competitive compatibility. And, you know, yeah. Bring the yeah. When you look at like, <laughs> say Apple, right? Apple hit this moment where it was almost impossible to be in an office environment with a Mac because Microsoft had held back development on Microsoft Office for the Mac. And so if you were that one designer in the shop, you couldn't mm -hmm. exchange documents with anyone else. Every time you open the document on your computer and saved it again, it would go corrupt. And Apple knew that this was a huge problem. So it went out and it reverse engineered the file formats of the entire office suite and released iWork numbers, pages, keynote. And now Mac users could read and write Office files perfectly without Microsoft's help, against Microsoft's wishes. That's the adversarial part of it. And what, yeah, it was a big yeah, yeah. I mean, lots of people, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. <laughs> and you know, it, it disciplined Microsoft, right? It changed the way that they, that they conducted themselves in the market. And it gave Apple the lift that it needed. Um, likewise, when Facebook started, you know, they had this huge problem, which was that everybody who already understood the value of a social network 
was penned in in an existing social network called MySpace. It was owned by like the world's most ruthless billionaire by Rupert Murdoch, who wasn't going to go gently into that good night. And so what Zuck did is he didn't say, come to Facebook. Our software is so much better than MySpace that you won't miss your friends, right? What he said was, come to Facebook and we'll put you in touch with your friends on MySpace. They made a bot that you could give your login and password to, go to MySpace, scrape your waiting messages, put them in your inbox on Facebook, let you reply to them, and then push them back out to MySpace. So you could emigrate from the Soviet right. Union, but have the experience that I had of emigrating from London. Now, what's happened in the years since is that the companies that achieved monopolistic power understand the importance of interoperability to disrupting monopolies, and they have foreclosed on the interoperable mechanisms that previously dominated the industry. They have used the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, as Facebook has, to make terms of service violations into felonies. Um, they have used the Digital Millennium right. Copyright Act, as Apple has, to make reverse engineering file formats and making interoperable hardware and software into a felony, and so on and so on. And what we've seen with initiatives like uh, Oracle v. Google, where they're seeking to conjure a new copyright law out of the whole cloth, to say that making an, an interoperable API it violates copyright law, which is just a crazy idea, which in fact may be carried on the strength of enormous sums of money, that um, it's not enough to reform the law to allow interoperability because with sufficient dry powder, right, with sufficient monopoly and sufficient cash from that monopoly, you can uh, envision a new anti-competitive weapon. You can pressurize a government or court to give it to you. And the industry is generally so concentrated that you can get everyone or at least a plurality of the dominating in firms in the industry to agree that this is what we want. So the old equilibrium where one firm would try to win a special gift and a rival would say that special gift is bad. Now they all sing from the same hymnal. People look mm -hmm. at that picture of all the tech leaders meeting with Trump in Trump Tower after the last election. They go, how could they all meet with Trump? And it's like, yeah, sure. How did they all fit around one table? Right. That's a far more important question than what they were talking about when they were at that table. So um, what I've proposed is an table. interoperator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what I've proposed is, is an interoperator's defense that rather than trying to ensure that none of these laws catch dolphins in their tuna nets, that instead what we say is that if you are doing something lawful, Right. If you are doing something that isn't prohibited by a law apart from the law that bans interoperability, then you have a defense against all claims. You have a defense against claims under trade secrecy, under non-compete, under patent, copyright circumvention, API copyrights, uh, you know, computer fraud and abuse claims, and so on. It's still going to be very judge heavy. It'll look a lot like fair use. But the questions that the judges will have to answer are not the boring procedural questions like, did you circumvent a technical protection measure? What they're going to have to ask are the policy questions. Did you act on behalf of a bona fide user for a legitimate purpose, for a purpose that Congress has never prohibited? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's the idea is to get a shut of the idea that dominant firms can write their own laws and then ask the state to enforce them which is a, a never ends well, right? It certainly doesn't produce a dynamic industry where new firms can do things that the old firms haven't envisioned uh, or decided were off limits and get away with it and do things that, you know, no one had ever thought of doing before. Um, plug a modem into a phone line or, uh, you know, take that mini computer and turn it into a video game console or any of the other things that have seen such enormous advances through the course of the industry. Right. So, uh, how how would you apply this um, the idea of interoperators' defense to like? Um, there's there's certainly been discussion mm -hmm. around antitrust, and obviously that's a more than a hammer. That's more of a more like a sledgehammer trying to find a a, a, a pin. Um, but uh, there's been some talk that uh, perhaps uh, more aggressive consent decrees or uh, some aggressive action um, where mergers have, have occurred over the last five, maybe even 10 years, and there sh should have been de consent decrees. And maybe that's a partial um, solution going forward. What's, what's your thought? Well, I mean, there, 
there is all of this energy for some kind of antitrust action. And I think the devil's obviously in the details. Some we would like, some we wouldn't like, whatever, right? I mean, you know, I think that the shareholders in Standard Oil were were initially pretty upset about the breakup. And 10 years later, when all when Standard Oil and all of its uh, progeny were worth more than Standard Oil had been before the breakup, they were all pretty happy about it. So, you know, wielded wisely, it's a good, it's a good tool. Um, but uh, I think that one of the great barriers to doing anything effective about monopoly is the power of monopoly itself. That that when you have monopoly rents okay. and you have a small uh, group of industry leaders who can solve the collective action problem of how to spend them, they can come together uh, and create a policy that is like counter to, to evidence, counter the public interest and make it sound good. Uh, and so, um, what I think we can imagine for a path to an interoperator's defense is that uh, rather than waiting for the day in which the monopolies are weak enough that they will consent to being broken up, right, which is like a, the chicken and egg problem mm -hmm. of, you know, so during IBM's antitrust suit, they outspent the entire DOJ competition division every single year during the 12 years that they were under <laughs> under antitrust investigation and then the DOJ gave up right so you know it was it, it, it that that is a very slow and painful process. But on the way, as you say, there are lots of consent decrees. You know, um, one of the things that, that uh, you know, that has made our technology very powerful has been the exercise of consent decrees and also the fear of antitrust enforcement in the past. So, you know, the reason we have Unix is that AT&T, before it was broken up, was put under uh, conditions uh, as a punishment for its previous bad actions. And among them were that it couldn't market software. And so it had to license out uh, Unix to third parties, which is how we got not just an operating system that turned out to be very powerful, but a multi-vendor operating system that turned out to be very powerful. And the story is very right. colorful. Transformed everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the story is very colorful because, you know, AT&T was obviously not very enthusiastic about having this product that they couldn't market themselves. And so they tried to like keep their engineers from shipping their patches and their engineers would phone up Unix enthusiasts from other companies and say, if you look behind a rock in this park, you'll find a data tape with this week's <laughs> patches. You know, it was, it was, Quite amazing. Really? Oh yeah. I, I wrote a, if you look at the <laughs> EFF page on adversarial interoperability, I wrote a case history of this. So um, consent decrees are definitely one area where we That's might, right. where we could see uh, a requirement that you exercise forbearance against interoperators who are doing things that are in service of, of, of the public interest that are not, that are adding features that don't violate a law. And, and this is where things like a privacy law is very important because, um, you know, you want to enable, say, uh, Ad Observer, which is the uh, NYU's uh, watchdog project for Facebook, that uh, Facebook users install a plugin, they scrape all the uh, ads that they see, it goes into a repository that journalists and scholars can access, and they can see whether or not Facebook is following its own policies on ads. So you want to enable that, but you don't want to enable Cambridge Analytica. And rather than asking Facebook to make the call about who's who's interoperating for a good reason and who's interoperating for a bad reason, you instead say, uh, Facebook doesn't get to make that call. All they get to do is point to a law that's being violated. And if there is a privacy law that Cambridge Analytica is violating, but Ad Observer isn't, then Facebook can ask for enforcement for a law. Rather than making up their own laws, they just get to point out when laws are being broken. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of other ways, like procurement guidelines, right? If, if you know, Since the Civil War, American government procurement has had a strong principle of interoperability in it. During the Civil War, uh, firearms manufacturers were required to have uh, second sources, right? To, 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 for there to be other parties who could manufacture parts and ammunition for, for the rifles they made, because it's crazy to be beholden to a single vendor uh, if you're fighting a war. So you could imagine a procurement guideline that says like, if right. you're supplying the US government or a school district or the DOT or any other big agency, the VA, the Department of Health, you have to you have to exercise forbearance in interoperators so that your electronic health records that you spin up for the VA or for Medicare can't become a source of anti-competitive lock-in. You have to publish a specification, you have to exercise forbearance and so on. Um, that's another way we could do it. And then, then finally, there's declarations of public policy, 
where uh, if a state makes a declaration of public policy that says that uh, uh, contractual terms that prohibit interoperability are against public policy, then contracts that contain that language become unenforceable as a matter of state law. And so there are lots of vehicles that we could use in the, the states of the laboratory of democracy. You could imagine it being implemented on a state mm -hmm. level in various different states in different ways to test out and find the probe the weaknesses in an interoperator's defense, find out what kind of backstopping laws we need that um, dominant firms can invoke in the event that an interoperator is doing something nefarious and, and to be able to find the holes in our other laws that are currently being stopped. Because it's, you know, the, the big tech companies will tell you truthfully that they do a really good job of protecting you against bad actors, provided those bad actors aren't them or their business partners, right? That, that you know, we have a, we, we, Schneier calls it the feudal security model where there are bandits out there in the world and we have these fortresses that have been built by feudal lords, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and and uh, mm -hmm. and 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 you know uh, the Google fortress and the Apple fortress, and you can go and hide yourself in their fortress, and they will defend you from all the bandits, but not themselves, right? You know, Apple is a great defender of your privacy from advertising, but they're not a great defender of your privacy from the Chinese government because they need to stay on the Chinese government's good side or they lose access to Chinese consumers and Chinese manufacturing. So when the Chinese government ordered them to remove working VPNs from the app store, they capitulated and they exposed Uyghurs and other disfavored minorities mm -hmm. to surveillance that has ultimately resulted in people being put into rape and concentration camps. And so, you know, being protected from everyone except the feudal Lord is a, a very distant second to being able to be protected from everyone. So it, so it sounds like basically what you're saying is that the current antitrust law, it's, it just can't apply to the way that um, big tech and industry works today. Because um, normally I would think that uh, in, uh, most people would feel like, uh, for that example you gave, that there should be some repercussions, that the, the government would um, aggressively go after a private company for abusing um, its users in such a way where they were imprisoned. You know, that sounds like probably a pretty good precedent. But right now, I can't think of any law or regulation or oversight that would do anything to uh, such a, um, I mean, it, it, it's somewhat anti-competitive, but it's certainly it's anti-user. Um, so uh, it, is your thought that basically antitrust is just um, completely outdated no, no. and we just need to do something new? And that's essentially what no, not at all. I would say that is. that in that antitrust has its role. <laughs> I think that we should have had stricter merger scrutiny all along. I think one of the ways that we got to where we got to is because we didn't apply antitrust. You know, these companies will tell you that they're large because okay. they provide excellent products to people that they make in house and realize efficiencies through. But when you look at how they grow, they're not making mm -hmm. things companies, they're buying things companies. Google is a company with one and a half successful in-house products. They made a great search engine and a good Hotmail clone. Every other product that they've made in-house failed. Every product that they have that's successful, they bought from someone else. So, you know, it, it, Facebook is hemorrhaging. That wind farm in Kansas has kind of kind of worked for a while. That you know, yeah, well, exactly. That wind farm in Kansas kind yeah. of worked for a while. And that fiber thing they did in the Midwest, it worked for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, and there's a I theory <laughs> that the reason Alphabet is structured the way it is is to create fracture lines that uh, are uh, like that that draw the attention of regulators, so that rather than splitting Google in a way that might provide meaningful mm -hmm. uh, alteration of its market power, like splitting out the ad units from the search units. They, they've structured so that like a regulator can look at Alphabet and say, all right, you've, 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 you've pushed me too far. You have to sell off the unit that makes the Wi-Fi balloons. And they'll be like, not the Wi-Fi balloons. You know, like I, 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 I think that I think there's definitely something to that. But I the thing about tech. Yeah, I always felt that way. It, yeah. it seemed like they pre-broke themselves I mean, up. Ready, there's another ready theory, to, which is that they just go. wanted to avoid becoming Yahoo, where they have so many princelings jousting for control that they're that they're all like just knifing each other in the back and failing to make anything good. Um, but you know, I, I think that antitrust has has a, a place, a role to play in the prohibition on, of uh, anti-competitive mergers. I think that you know, as a like a bedrock principle, if a company uh, undertook a merger 
on the basis of a promise of good behavior, right? So when Facebook promised that it wouldn't um, mine uh, uh, user data from Instagram and WhatsApp in combination with Facebook data and just straight up lied, right? Like just, just, just didn't do what they said they would do, that if at some point in the future they want to make an acquisition and the regulator determines that the only basis for making that acquisition is to extract a similar promise, that we shouldn't believe them. Right? Like that just seems to be like the minimum standard of prudence. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, we don't get fooled again. Just like George Bush told us. Right? Just uh, not, not allow the, the merger based on yeah. bad performance? Well, look, if you've been told, if, if you have determined as a regulator that a merger isn't safe unless some conduct is, is uh, promised, right? Mm -hmm. And the last time that company promised that conduct, they lied. Mm -hmm. Why would you allow the merger? Right? That just seems yeah. like the, the absolute minimum standard of prudence is you shouldn't believe people who've lied to you before when they make the same promise. I mean, I, I would entertain a principle that said you shouldn't believe people who've lied before, period. But I think just at a minimum, if your kid says, I'm not going to eat the marshmallow, and then they eat the marshmallow, and then they say, but I won't eat the marshmallow this time, you should say, look, you're, you and marshmallows have a problem. I'm not going to believe you when it comes to marshmallows anymore, right? That That's just like minimum standard. You know, yeah. Great example. I have a 12 year old. <laughs> Unless you're posting it on Instagram and then, right. then you get more right. clicks. So, then so you know, I think that's like, that should just know. be the minimum standard. So I do think uh, antitrust has its place. But I, what I'd say is that like the, par the tech exceptionalism that I'm 100% here for is that interoperability in, in general purpose computers over a general purpose internet imparts a competitive character to the tech industry that is missing from other industries. That, you know, the, the in Australia, mm -hmm. there's this infamous thing called the multi-gauge model, where the rail barons of the early years of the colonization of Australia all sought commercial advantage by laying rails at different uh, gauges. And now you can't get a train across the country, right? And they've tried a lot of ways to fix it. They built... Um, uh, there's been over 200 designs for rail carriages that have different wheelbases and one set of wheels retracts and the other set drops down. None of them have ever worked. None. Up, up and down. That the answer they've arrived at is tearing up rails and putting down new ones. That's the cheapest, most reliable thing, right? So that is right. very different from Apple having a building full of engineers who just figure out how office works, right? And just, just make office mm. work. That is, that is hugely different. And what it does is it converts walled gardens into feed pens, right? In, in which all of the potential customers for your business have been neatly organized by your competitor for you to go in and just, oh, you know, sorry. I, I ate a little too aggressively there. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, if we can unleash that, right? That is what gave us the dynamism of the early tech years. And, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot because there's a story about technological utopians and, and, and digital liberties activists and we, what we got wrong. And there's this story that's like, we just thought if everybody got connected, it wouldn't matter what would happen, everything would be fine. And you don't start EFF if you think everything's going to be fine, right? You have to, on the one hand, be extremely excited about the possibilities right. of tech, but just scared witless of how it could go wrong. And I think that's the portrait I recognize. And to the extent that we overestimated something, it wasn't the idea that uh, technology would just automatically be great. It was the intrinsic willingness of lawmakers to enforce uh, anti-monopoly rules on tech companies. Because if you were like me, so I got my Apple II Plus in 1979 when I was eight years old, right? So. Within three years, I had a modem connected to a phone line that had been deregulated through the AT&T breakup. And now there was competition in my phone lines. Two years later, mm -hmm. the IBM PC came out and it ran a third party operating system because IBM, after 12 years of antitrust enforcement, did not want to bring the antitrust enforcers back in the room by creating a vertical monopoly on software and hardware. They created Microsoft out of the whole cloth. And then Microsoft ended up cornering 95% of the operating system market. And the DOJ right. swooped in and we were like, well, they lost that one. I guess you win some and you lose some. But Microsoft was so cowed by the experience, so traumatized by the DOJ antitrust enforcement that they didn't do to Google what they'd done to Netscape. So we got Google, right? And so if you were like me and you, that was your formative years, 
then you could be forgiven, I hope, for looking back on that and going, the combination of anti-monopoly enforcement and the flexibility of technology itself creates an environment in which one day Cray can be the most powerful computing company on earth, and the next day can be a division of Silicon Graphics, mm -hmm. and the next day Silicon Graphics can be out of business. Right, that 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 is the that's the right. natural course that we would never find a web made of five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four because as soon as everybody was stuck on Facebook, someone would go to Facebook what Facebook did to MySpace, and instead what happened was every time Zuck saw a company about to do to Facebook what Facebook did to MySpace, he went out and bought it, and lied about it, and then he did it again, and the lawmakers were like. Okay. Uh, you lied last time, but I think this time you're telling the truth. You've got an honest face, kid. And, and you know, that, yeah. My mom thinks yeah. you look nice. So. It's, it's, like, like Katie Porter said, everybody makes fun of your haircut and my haircut. Uh, uh, you know, that, that, that was the thing we underestimated. And that's the corrective we need. And we need to unleash the potential for technology yeah. to topple giants, right? To, to create a dynamic market that responds to the needs of technology users instead of converting themselves to just pure rentierism, to, to inkjet printer business models, where, where you just have these, the entire market becomes this kind of hourglass shape, where on this side, you have all the users, and on this side, you have all the suppliers. And in the middle, you just have a gatekeeper that does nothing ex except extract money from the people who want to send stuff this way and the people who want to send stuff that way, and, and who crush anything going between that pinch of the hourglass that might endanger their business. That's not how we get a, a, a tech uh, industry that can uh, challenge the growing hegemony of China, you know, and, and when when AT and T got broken up in '82, there was this story that if we broke up AT and T, that we would lose to Japan. Japan, after all, was this ex-fascist country that just copied American designs, and without our national champion in the form of AT and T, we were doomed. It turned out that AT and T's major project was blocking modems, and that killing AT and T gave us the internet. And that the commercial internet has been a source of American right. soft power and industrial might for the last 40 years. The best thing we could have possibly done is broken up this brooding giant that was sitting on progress. And, you know, today, the grandchildren of that giant, right, Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, they are sitting on an entire you know, uh, writhing, energetic American entrepreneurial workforce you know, the technologists who don't want to settle for free massages on Wednesdays and kombucha in the mini kitchen, but want to actually someday compete with their bosses. And the only way we're going to unleash that is if we make right. interoperability lawful and stop anti-competitive mergers. Okay. So uh, something to, to kind of spin off on, there's an example of uh, an attempt at regulatory um, oversight um, in Europe with the GDPR, and um, it, they've they've certainly tried their own versions of antitrust in the past, and I, I think most part have largely failed or been laughed off by the big big tech because they're like five billion, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll just have to reduce the lunch budget for one of my offices for a few months. Um, so, uh, what what are your thoughts on GDPR? And there's it, there was some discussion yesterday about how it's it's just basically um, uh, restricted innovation by uh, making it so that only big tech, Google, Facebook, as an example, can compete in that environment because they have yeah. the bucks to comply. Well, it's definitely a mixed bag. Fight. You know, they they. Uh, and and I see from Marshall here that we're running out of time. So I don't. I, running down the whole GDPR story would be would be a long story. But I I think understanding the problems of GDPR, you you touched on one, which is that the compliance hurdles are um, are are you know not proportional. That you can impose a compliance hurdle on Facebook that Facebook can handily bear, but its smaller competitors can't. And so one of the things we see about ad tech in Europe is that. You know, within a year of the GDPR, all the small companies were gone, uh, and and you know that's true. It's also true that Facebook, Google, and the other big tech companies. One of the reasons they survived GDPR and the smaller companies didn't is that they had a lot more to lose, and they were playing an iterated game, and so their privacy practices have become much more moderate 
than than the smaller brokers. The smaller brokers were cowboys. Mm. And so if they were asked to secure permission for all the things that they planned yeah. on doing, which is the core of the GDPR, which is the idea that if you're going to do permission marketing, you should actually have permission, which I don't think is a thing anyone should should object to, right? That you should that if you claim to have consent, the consent should be meaningful, right? It can't just be like by being dumb enough to use my product, you agree that I'm allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother and wear your underwear and make long distance calls and eat all the food in your fridge, right? Like there needs to be an actual meaningful consent for what it is you're 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 doing. Um, so that's definitely like one of the issues. Uh, and another issue, as you point out, is that um, Facebook and Google have the money. To to, to deal with enforcement issues that, you know, arguably they're not in compliance. They're just in more compliance than the small firms are. And they are daring Vestager and the other mm -hmm. antitrust uh, people there and the privacy people to come after them. And, and they are betting that they won't face that kind of uh, enforcement. And it's, it's a big bet. Uh, so, you know, kind of in some ways the jury's still out. And then there's, there's the uh, question of, um, uh, uh, right to be forgotten, which is just a catastrophe, uh, and maybe something for another day. But just you know, letting letting rich people spend money to make everybody else shut up about the crimes they've committed is like a really bad idea. Holy moly! <laughs> okay, so yeah, no, that is a discussion for another day because unfortunately we're out of time. Um, it's been really great catching up with you. Um, your examples today have been spot on. I've really <laughs> enjoyed this. this Can discussion. I plug my new book? Um, well, you have your oh, little brother yeah, book go, go endorsed it. by yes. Edward Snowden, uh, a tax surface. There you go. Oh, well, there you Just go. came out last month. Thank you. Congratulations, by the way, on your latest publication. Um, well, noted author, Corey. Nice talking to you too. It was great to talk Thanks, to you. Uh, we'll yeah, talk enjoy to the rest of your conference. Have a wonderful day.